All right, so uh, now we're going to get to kind of the fun part, I think, at least, of uh, the chapter when we're talking about VSCPR, uh, because we're going to look at uh, the many different uh, exceptions to VSCPR theory. So um, let's let's go through this example. Um, this is a polyatomic ion containing indium, and so let's use VSC, uh, let's use VSCPR theory to predict the uh, structure of it. So what do we do first? Well, we got to come up with the Lewis structure. So we got to calculate the number of valence electrons. Indium, and you may have to look at a PRI table for this one, a little more exotic, but it's in the boron group. That's below boron. Boron has three valence electrons. Okay, so so does indium. And then you have chlorine. Uh, chlorine's a halogen, of course, so seven, seven valence electrons, five of them, okay, plus two. And so this gets you three plus uh, 35, 38, 40 valence electrons. So let's see, what does VSEPR say here? What's the Lewis structure going to be? Well, we're going to put indium is way less electronegative than chlorine. So indium is a central atom. And we're going to put our valence electrons here and give all the chlorines a complete octet, 2468. There's five of them, they're all equivalent. Um, and so uh, eight times five is 40, so we're good. And we can put the two minus. Okay, so the prediction would be we have five ligands and we have zero lone pairs uh, around the central atom, indium. So it should be trigonal by parameter. What's the actual structure? Square parameter. Why? Um, if you try to read this or look this up online, I'll read about this, you will see that people say, um, this is because it is uh, due to packing effects, okay? What does that mean? Okay, this is a solid state um, structure. So this is a crystal structure, crystal is made of this. It's due to some packing effect. Somehow it's trying to argue that, you know, for some reason this molecule is special and that it packs better. The, the, the inter my, it, there's also gonna be a cation here, okay? That's not shown, some sort of cation. Um, that somehow the molecules are gonna fit better with the cation if it's square parameter. The truth is that doesn't really help us. There's no way to say when a packing effect is going to occur, not at least in any straightforward way using this theory, okay? So the more the truth is to say VSCPR is wrong. And this is just trying to you know, make up an excuse of why it's wrong here, okay? Um, let's, let's do this example. Uh, this is sort of an ammonia analog, okay? But let's go ahead and write the uh, number of valence electrons. So nitrogen has five, um, silicon has four, and there's three of them. And so what's that? So there are four valence electrons, silicon is below carbon, and there's three of them, so four times three. And then hydrogen, there's nine here. Hydrogen is in group one, so there's one times nine. And so that gets us five plus uh, 12 is 17. Plus nine is 26 valence electrons, very good. And so we know hydrogen is going to be on the end um, and nitrogen is uh, going to be um, in the center here just because of how this is written. Even though nitrogen is more electronegative than, than silicon, I believe we have, yeah, it is. Uh, we have a uh, kind of clue of what, what the connectivity here. And, you know, you can experimentally determine what the connectivity is. But nitrogen is at the center. You have these silo groups. This is sort of like, you know, it's analogous to a methyl group, right? And so you're going to have something like, let me again uh, draw the, the hydrogens out here just for counting purposes so we can see what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so we got these silo groups hanging out here. And so now what do we have? We have two, four, six, eight. Um, and we have two, four, six, eight, and two, four, six, eight. So that's uh, three sets of eights. That's 24. We have two valence electrons left. That's going to be a lone pair on the central atom. That's nice because nitrogen now satisfies the octet. Silicon satisfies the octet, and hydrogen satisfies the duet. Cool. So VSCPR predicts then that there's three ligands, right? Three things binding to the central atom one, two, three, and there's one lone pair. So that's a tetrahedral arrangement. Um, and that is uh, going to then be trigonal because we're removing one, one away from, from the tetrahedron. So we take a tetrahedron, remove a, a vertex, 
and we get um, we get a trigonal pyramidal uh, geometry. That's what VSU card predicts. Shockingly, this is actually a trigonal planar molecule. It's a trigonal planar molecule when it's a uh, liquid. It's a trigonal planar molecule when it's a solid. It's a trigonal planar molecule when it's a gas. Can't say it's packing effects if it's a ga gas, right? I mean, it, 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 gases don't pack. They're, ga a gas is defined by how they're far apart. apart. So clearly, VSEPR is, is totally wrong here. And um, what is more likely a reason why VSEPR is wrong? Well, it probably, um, if you look this up, okay, in a textbook, they will try to explain their way out of this, saying that it's due to um, d-orbital interaction between uh, an, uh, that's on the silicon, okay, um, because silicon is in what third row, so there are empty d-orbitals, and that there's some interaction between the unhybridized p-z orbital on nitrogen. Now, so this is called d-pi p-pi backbone, okay. First thing to say is that this now is invoking molecular orbitals and, or atomic orbitals and making a molecular orbital interaction. So we're, we've diverted from, from VSEPR. Fine, I'm, I'm willing to, to do that and we will get into to molecular orbital. The even worse thing, um, oh, and by the way, they say, okay, then this deep, 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 this backbonding interaction is maximized when the molecule is plain, which would be true, okay. Um, the problem is that this is actually totally false, okay? Um, not only is this, you know, just kind of trying to get VSEPR to work somehow, making an excuse for it, but if you do the actual quantum mechanical calculations, this reasoning is actually false. So it's a doubly wrong um, explanation, which is quite frustrating. And just so you know, um, modern day calculations basically show that d orbitals play essentially no role in main group chemistry. So if you're talking about the structure and bonding dynamics of uh, anything in the main group, so silicon, things like that, um, d orbitals aren't going to be involved. d orbitals are there, but they're unoccupied. They're not of the right energy to uh, play a critical role here. What's a better explanation, probably? Probably it has to do with sterics. And so um, you know, I don't want you to, to uh, get too caught up in the details here, but I, I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, if you uh, make a very simple model, okay, so what do we have? We have three silicon atoms arranged in a, a planar environment, okay, and so you can draw, model that by three circles, and you know, we can look up the radius of the, the silicon atom, and then we know that nitrogen apparently can fit inside here, and so you can do some geometry, okay, it's kind of a fun geometry problem. You can figure out what the maximum circle is, small circle, that can fit into three circles that are touching like this, okay? And it turns out, well, here's the relationship, but it turns out it's about 0.15 times, uh, it has a rate, the small circle will have a radius of about 0.15 times uh, the radius of the bigger circle. So that sets up a hypothesis that we can make where, whereby if the radius of nitrogen is less than the radius, uh, less, uh, larger than 0.15 times, 15%, the radius of silicon, then the molecule must be trigonal parameter. In other words, if, if nitrogen is too big, the central atom is too big, and it can't fit in this hole here, the molecule is going to have to distort it. It's a totally different way of thinking about it. It's not thinking about it from the SEPR at all. It's thinking about it from this geometry standpoint, right? Um, if, if the nitrogen is too big and can't fit in the hole, then these, sil these silicon atoms are going to bend down and distort, and you know, it's going to be a pyramidal type structure. Okay? Otherwise, it will be planar. What is the actual value? Uh, radius of nitrogen is about 14.3% of that of silicon. So this structure is planar. Now you can make a prediction. And for extra credit, I want you to, um, for one extra credit point, send me an email and let me know what you, what you predict the structure would be of the phosphorus analog of this uh, uh, compound. So phosphorus here instead of nitrogen and why. All right, um, so here's another geom uh, uh, example where, where geometry and sterics tend to play a role. If you go through here, um, 
this is actually quite an, an interesting one. Let's let's go through it again. Okay, so number of valence electrons. Um, tellurium is six, it's a chalcosin. Um, bromine is seven, it's a halogen. Uh, but we have to add two because of the uh, two minus charge there. So that's uh, eight plus 42, that's 50 valence electrons. And so then we go ahead and we connect everything. We're gonna have six of these bromine atoms. Let's see, that's five, six, and I'm gonna put a lone pair everywhere. Okay, and what happens here is you have 48 uh, valence electrons at this point. Why is it 48? Well, oops, I forgot these, these eight. Each bromine is two, four, six, eight, and we have six of them, six times eight is 48. Okay, so we have, we need to add the 49th and the 50th um, electrons. Cool, so that gets us what? That gets us six ligands, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, and one lone pair on the tellurium there, central atom. That is steric number seven. Pentacle, uh, that steric geometry is pentagonal by pyramidal ring. So what do we think the uh, DSCPR would predict for this, okay? Um, well, DSCPR is definitely not gonna predict this because I just got rid of lone pair, right? So we're either this one, we're gonna have a steric geometry of um, seven or this one we are where we have a steric geometry of seven. So the question basically is, um, what does VSMPR predict? Do we, are we gonna have the lone pair in the axial site or are we gonna have the lone pair in the equatorial site? Well, we gotta think about it. Remember electrons in VSPR theory, lone pairs, want to go to the Rumia site. What is the Rumia site? Well, here we have a 72 degree angle. Why? Because there's a pentagon, right? 360 degrees divided by five is, is 72. Here we have a 90 degree angle. So um, the electron's not gonna wanna go there because uh, that is uh, much more crowded being in the Pentagon. So VSEPR predicts this, okay? And so this is the VSEPR prediction, okay? Now, this is the weird sort of thing here, um, or not the weird sort of thing, but there's a lot of weird sort of things about this, but an interesting thing. First, the interesting thing, then the weird thing. The interesting thing is that um, VSEPR here wants the electron, the lone pair to be an axial site. Remember for trigonal bipyramidal example that we did in other, uh, uh, a previous video where we had T-shape, we said that the bulkiest site there was actually uh, the ax, uh, was the roomiest site there was actually the equatorial site. Here's the exact opposite. So in that case, trigonal bipyramidal, you want a T-shape um, or seesaw type, type shapes, which put the lone pair in the equatorial position. But there, the, this value here in the equatorial was 120 degrees, because it was a triangle, right? Very different here, because it's a pentagon. So that's kind of cool, okay? So that's, that's a difference there. And you know, it's kind of cool. VSMPR can make these predictions, things like that. This is now the weird thing. So that was an interesting thing. Now here's the weird part. The actual structure is octahedral, <laughs> okay? Which is really weird, because uh, what, what happened to the lone pair? What happened to it? Well, did the lone pair just disappear? No, I mean, you, you have 50 advanced electrons. The, the lone pair is still there, okay? You just cannot draw a Lewis structure for this that reflects the actual structure, which is an octahedron. Where is the lone pair then? The question breaks down because VSEPR um, is always just dealing with lone pairs, but the reality is that that's not how bonding and electron distributions work, okay? And we'll see that quantum mechanics and molecular orbital theory are a better reflection of where electrons are. And so the answer is the electron is in the molecular orbital somewhere. It's in a molecular orbital somewhere. It's delocalized. We can't draw a, um, a Lewis structure that is um, in agreement with the experimentally determined structure of octahedral. And that is kind of a little bit um, mind blowing. Uh, we can go a little further and do the same sort of logic where uh, you can do some geometry uh, and you can draw six circles now in three-dimensional space. The geometry problem gets a little crazy, but you know, it's geometry, so you can do it. We don't have to do it. I'm not gonna ask you to do it. I just want you to appreciate the steric argument here. So it's a similar thing as uh, for that nitrogen silo complex compound I showed you. Um, the, the, the largest circle that can fit in 
six circles oriented in an octahedron um, has a radius of 0.41, okay, that of the larger atom. So um, if the central atom is less than 0.41 times the radius of the uh, terminal atom, we are predicting that um, the central atom can fit in this hole there, and it'll be octahedral. Otherwise, if it's too big, the central atom's too big, we're going to have distortion. And we're going to have a distorted octahedral complex. And we're going to look more like the VSCR prediction. We're just going to call this distorted octahedra. Uh, it doesn't really have a name other than distorted octahedra. It's a, a seven-coordinate system. Um, it doesn't have a special name. Okay. Getting to rarer cases. Uh, so you can look at this, and you can actually calculate. You can look at experimentally a bunch of different compounds, and it works pretty well. It's not perfect, but this very simple theory of sterics works pretty well. You can see for something like uh, xenon uh, hexafluoride, uh, you have a very large ratio here, so you're definitely going to be a distorted octahedron. In other words, xenon is too big to fit within uh, this octahedron. Okay. Um, same thing with this antimony chloride complex, um, although. It's in the solid state, it's one way in the octahedral state, uh, in, the, in the solution state, it's another geometry. So there's, it's telling you that depending upon the environment, these two structures are very close in energy. Um, and, and, and same things for things on the dividing line uh, and, and here. But once you're lower than 0.41, uh, both in, in, in the solid state and in solution, you are now uh, octahedral because these atoms compared to the ligands are small enough to fit in the hole that is formed by the octahedral arrangement of the uh, atoms. So hopefully you're gaining some appreciation for the complexities that can arise and really how simple VSCPR theory is and how it makes um, a lot of mistakes, but it's, it's amazing that it actually gets it right so many times given how simple it is.